Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fullerton and today I want to talk to you about work. Our objectives are going to be to calculate the work done by a force on an object undergoing a displacement and secondly to relate the work done to the area under a graph of force as a function of position. So to begin with, let's talk about what is work. In a physics sense, work is the process of moving an object by applying a force. The object has to move for work to be done, so if you go push and push and push against a wall and nothing moves, you're not doing any work from a physics sense. Secondly, the force, the force must cause the movement. Now work is a scalar quantity, it doesn't have a direction, and its units are joules, which is equivalent to a newton times a meter. In one dimension, if we look at a box on a plane and we apply a force at some angle theta causing a displacement, delta x, we could calculate the work done as the work is going to be equal to the component of force in the direction of the displacement, which I can draw here as the component of force in the direction of displacement. That'll be F cos theta. So work is F cosine theta times the displacement, delta x. Or we could write that as the force vector dotted with delta x, our displacement vector there. What if it's a non-constant force, though? Here we have a varying force as a position of x. Well, in this case, the way you would find the work done would be to take the area under the graph. Area under the graph gives us the work in a force versus displacement graph. How do you calculate that, though? Well, if it's a simple graph, perhaps you can use geometry. Otherwise, you're probably going to have to go to calculus. Break up your graph into very small sections of width dx, and then work becomes the integral from your initial x to your final x of the force f of x dx. All right, but what about if it's in multiple dimensions instead of just one dimension? For example, here we have an object moving along a path where the force varies across the, uh, across the path. The force could be pretty long here and up and to the right. Over here, it could be up and to the left. You can have a varying force. And as we do this, we have varying uh, displacements, little bits of dr. And those can be in different directions as you move across the, uh, across the line. We'll call this a line integral. The way we would get the work here is to sum up all the little f dot drs. So a little bit of work, a differential of work, is going to be the force vector dotted with dr. So to get the total work done, work is going to be the integral of that differential of work. Or in this case, it'll be the integral from some initial position, r1, to some final position, r2, of f dot dr. Or in general form, work is the integral of f dot dr. And we call this a line integral because you're integrating over a line. Let's take an example and see how this works with a uh, going back to Hooke's law, a spring. Let's assume we have a spring that obeys Hooke's law where the force on the spring is equal to some spring constant k times the displacement from its equilibrium position x. And oftentimes you'll see this written as the force is equal to minus kx. That's because it's a restoring force. If you stretch the spring one way, the force wants to bring it back to where it started. So it's in the opposite direction of the displacement. We'll focus on magnitude for now. How much work is done in compressing the spring from equilibrium to some point x? Well, let's take a look at our definition of work. Work is going to be the integral of f dot dr, our general form. Or in this case, because dr is dx, we're only looking in one dimension. That's going to be the integral of f dot dx. Well, we're going to integrate that from some initial x value 0 to some final x value x. And our force, f of x, I replace with kx. And we have our dx. We don't have any angle in there because the cosine of 0 is 1. They're in the same direction. Now, our k is a constant. It can come out of the integral, so we can write that work equals k integral from 0 to x 
of x dx. This implies then that work equals k, the integral of x dx is going to be x squared over two, evaluated from zero to x, which just means that we're going to take our top value x, plug it in for our variable, so that's x squared over two, minus, take our other limit, zero squared over two, and we come up with one half k x squared. And hopefully that looks pretty familiar. One half k x squared, the potential energy stored in a spring. And that should make sense. If we did that much work to compress or extend the spring, where'd that energy go? It must have gone into the spring. Let's take a look now at a nonlinear spring. Apply this again. The force required to extend a nonlinear spring is described by f of x is one half kx squared. Find the work in compressing the spring to some point x. All right, well, same basic idea. Work is going to be our integral from zero to x of f of x dx, but now f of x is one half kx squared dx. Our one half k can come out, so that's k over two integral from zero to x of x squared dx, or k over two, the integral of x squared is going to be x cubed over three evaluated from zero to x. Therefore, our work is going to be k over two. Now we have x cubed over three minus, plug in our zero for x, zero cubed over three, or I come up with our work of kx cubed over three. 6. Okay, so we can do this for a nonlinear spring the same way. Using that same basic formula, work is the integral of f dot dr and applying it to the situation that we're dealing with. Let's talk about the work energy theorem, see if we can derive it. To do this, we're going to start with a couple, uh, couple equations that are already familiar. First off, Newton's second law, f equals ma. But remember, acceleration is the derivative of velocity, so I'm going to rewrite this as m dv dt, mass times acceleration, written as dv dt. I also know that velocity is the derivative of position, v equals dx dt. So if I rearrange this, I can say that dx equals v dt. That's going to be my starting point. Now, Let's go back to our definition of work. In one dimension, work is going to be the integral from some initial x, xi, to some final x, x final, of f of x dx. That's going to be equal to, well, I'm going to replace f of x with m dv dt, and I'm going to replace dx with v dt. So that's the integral from x initial to x final of m dv dt times v dt. My dt's make a ratio of one, and what I've really done is I've changed my variable of integration, m dv times v. So I'm going to rewrite this as work equals the integral from v initial to v final, correspond corresponding to the velocity at x initial and x final of m v dv. Now, next step, notice that mass is a constant in this problem. We can pull that out of the integral sign. Therefore, work equals m integral from v initial to v final of v dv. The integral of v is going to be v squared over two, so that's going to be m v squared over two evaluated from vi to vf, or m v final squared over two minus m v initial squared over two. Now, if you recall, kinetic energy is one half m v squared. So this is really the final kinetic energy. That's the initial kinetic energy. Therefore, the work done is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy or final minus initial implies that work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. There's the work energy theorem. When you do work on an object, you give it energy. When the energy of an object changes, work is being done on the system, or the system is doing work on another object. 
work equals change in kinetic energy, the work energy theorem. Let's see if we can't apply it in an example. A pickup truck with mass 1,000 kilograms is traveling at 30 meters per second. The driver sees a dog on the road 31 meters ahead. Oh no. What force must the brakes exert in order to stop the truck in a distance of 30 meters, assuming constant acceleration and therefore saving our dear pooch? Well, let's start off with what we know. Mass is 1,000 kilograms. We know the initial velocity of the truck is 30 meters per second. We're sure hoping that the distance it takes for the truck to stop is 30 meters, and the final velocity must be zero. Let's go back to the work energy theorem. The net work done is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy, or kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. If the object is stopped when we're all done, its final kinetic energy must be zero. Its initial kinetic energy we can get is one half mv initial squared, or one half times 1,000 kilograms times our initial velocity, 30 meters per second squared, which gives us negative 450,000 joules. So then how do we get the force? Well, let's go back to our definition of work, where work is the force times the displacement. Net work, in this case in one dimension, is going to be force times the displacement, assuming the brakes are acting in the uh, same direction as the displacement, in the same linear direction, no angle to deal with. Therefore, force equals net work divided by displacement, or negative 450,000 joules over 30 meters, which gives us a final force of negative 15,000 newtons. Negative because the force is in the opposite direction is what we call our positive displacement. Now you could also verify this if you wanted to using your kinematics. You could find the acceleration using Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2ad. And once you found that acceleration, use that with Newton's second law, F equals ma. Try it yourself. You'll get negative 15,000 Newtons. Exact same answer, just two different ways to solve the same problem. Hopefully that gets you started pretty well with work in one dimension and multiple dimensions. If you need more help or looking for assistance, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.